Hi everyone. Uh, thanks for thanks for joining us tonight. My name is Travis Forney. I'm an adult services librarian at the Willoughby Public Library, and we're coming to you live from downtown Willoughby in Lake County, Ohio. Uh, tonight we're going to talk to graphic novelist Durf Bacter about his new novel or his new graphic novel, Kent State. Before we get started tonight, I want to tell you about a few upcoming programs in the Between the Lines series. Coming tomorrow, uh, we've got number one New York Times bestseller, Christina Baker Klein, who will talk to us about her new novel, uh, The Exiles, which is just out this month. Then, in, then at the end of the month, we have uh, Cleveland's own DM Pulley, a mystery author. If you're watching this event, you know how to register, so please consider doing so for those future events. Tonight, I'm extremely excited to welcome Durf to Between the Lines. Uh, Kent State is Durf's fourth graphic novel. He's also the author of Punk Rock and Trailer Parks about Akron's punk rock heyday. My Friend Dahmer, which was named one of the top five nonfiction books of 2012 by Time Magazine and was made into a feature film in 2017 and trashed about his experiences as a 21 year old garbage man. Durf has enjoyed a long career in comics, starting as a, as a political cartoonist for the Ohio State Lantern while he was in college. His comic strip, The City, appeared in 140 publications over a quarter century, and he has received over 50 awards for his newspaper work. He was part of the newsroom team of the Akron Beacon Journal that won the Pulitzer Prize. Uh, in 2006, he won a Robert F. Kennedy Journalism Award for cartooning, and in 2016, he won an Eisner Award for letter. Durf has a PowerPoint presentation that he's going to go through tonight, and he'll answer some questions afterward. If you have a question for Durf and you're watching on Zoom, type it in the chat, and Facebook, type it as a comment, and I'll try and grab the questions and uh, ask them to Durf. Without further ado, welcome Durf back, Durf. Hi, thanks everyone. Thanks for having me. It's great to be here. Um, I'm going to share the screen and just start. Uh, um, start my presentation since there's no point in staring at my ugly mug. All right. Is that good, Travis? That's good. All right, here we go. So I'm here to talk about my new book, which came out last week, Kent State. Um, it is about the Kent State massacre from, uh, took place in 1970, as anyone in Northeast Ohio knows. Um, it was supposed to be out last April, but uh, it was delayed until September. You all know why. And uh, it's it's been absolutely terrifying sitting here in my studio over the course of the summer watching this book become more and more relevant with each passing day. I mean, I thought it was going to be relevant when I started working on it four years ago. And but now the summer of, of 2020 has just been it's been jaw dropping. I mean, I, it, it appears as if we'd circle completely back around to 1970, which is one of the worst years we've ever had. Although 2020 is uh, looking like it could well top it. This is a graphic novel, which is a lofty term for a large comic book. And <clears throat> that may seem a little bit unusual to some people who aren't comics fans, but this is not Archie and Jughead go to the, go to the anti-war movement. Uh, you know, graphic novels are, we're right now in a golden era of graphic novels and they are, they are just uh, coming fast and furious and of unbelievable quality for adults, for kids, for teens. Uh, graphic novels have won Pulitzer Prizes. They've won National Book Awards. I think there's been four graphic novelists who've been granted uh, MacArthur Genius Grants. I unfortunately am not one of those four. Um, so this is a legitimate art form that is growing in stature in this country at last. Elsewhere around the world, it's held in very high esteem. It's every bit the same critical acclaim that you see uh, paid to film or, or music or or literature. Whoops. Now, why am I not? So my story begins <clears throat> in April 1970, when the Ohio National Guard invaded my hometown. I grew up in Richfield, which is about uh, 20 miles due 
due west of Kent. And the guard was sent in to crush a Teamster strike, which was taking place at the truck depots by the Ohio Turnpike exit there. And this had a profound effect on me. I was 10 years old, uh, just a kid. But to suddenly have your, your town under military occupation, you know, that tends to leave a mark. Um, Context is very important. I don't dwell on it a lot. I'm just going to really rush through it here. Of course, 1970, the dominant issue was the Vietnam War, which was a total quagmire by 1970. This is after Tet. This is after all the, you know, the big battles. Uh, 1969 was one of the deadliest years of the war, over 11,000 dead. It was sucking the country dry. It was tearing the country in two. And the streets were filling with protesters. Millions and millions of people took to the streets to demand the war's end. Campuses around the country were exploding in anti-war, violent anti-war protests. This is actually Ohio State, which was worse than Kent State. Ohio State flared up earlier, a week earlier than Kent State, and it was far larger and far more violent. And the guard was sent in there too. <clears throat> Cities were in flames around the country. This is Cleveland in 1968. In Ohio, Governor James A. Rhodes, a two-term governor at that point, kept order at the point of a gun. Rhodes sent out the guard more than any other governor in the country to crush civil and labor unrest. Texas at number two wasn't even close. And Ohio had some of the laxest rules for engagement of any National Guard. Only a handful of guards were allowed to carry live ammo into civil disturbances, and Ohio was one of them. Rhodes was a <clears throat> law and order strong man. He was kind of a down-home oaf uh, who couldn't form a grammatically correct sentence if, uh, if, if, you, if you pressed him. But he was a one of the shrewdest politicians Ohio has ever produced. He dominated this, this state for, for 25 years. He was a staunch Nixon ally, and he was a firm believer in using the guard to, to uh, further his political agenda. <clears throat> now, back in Richfield, I mean, this, the situation there just completely freaked me out. As a kid, you process things in a different way. You know, I mean, it's, it was a blissful little kid life. I really didn't think about what was happening in the world around me. I mean, yeah, there was a Vietnam War, but there had always been a Vietnam War as far as I was concerned. I don't remember a time when there wasn't. Yeah, campuses were in flames, cities were in flames, but these things had always happened. I mean, again, it's that perspective of the I didn't see this stuff develop. I was born into it, but this was different. And this really, really sparked something in me. Um, the guard camped right across the street from our elementary school. So I saw these trucks and Jeeps going by all day long. And nobody talked to us about this, uh, the kids, I mean. It was just, we were left to process it on our own. And, and that kind of blows my mind because I don't think people really understand how disturbing it was to us because, you know, these were, these Teamsters were the fathers of my classmates. They were my Little League coaches, Cub Scout leaders. And when the bus, the school buses drove by the truck depots, the drivers made the kids lie on the floor of the bus as we passed the guard. So you can't, you know, it really left a mark. And I, and it, you know, like I said, it sparked something in me. And for the first time, I began kind of looking around at the world outside. And that's really why I've, I've carried this story with me ever since, because I can draw a straight line from Kent State to majoring in journalism in college, to becoming a political cartoonist, on and on and on. And it's always been a story I've been interested in. And I know this sounds obnoxiously precocious, you know, a 10 year old really, but here's some proof. This is a political cartoon I drew in 1970 about the guard. So, I, I mean, I was really thinking about this stuff. This is from a year later. This is uh, Richard Nixon as King vote for me or else. And you can tell a kid drew it because that's Gallardi over his shoulder. And of course, we would have been better off voting for Gallardi in 1972, but you know, that's the way it goes. So um, for me, this has always been a story near and dear to my heart. And I've always followed the developments over the years. I've been to a number of the commemorations. 
Um, I have no connection to Kent State. I'm a complete outsider. I didn't go to Kent State. Obviously, I wasn't there. I was a different generation. But nonetheless, it's something that's really moved me. And I always recognize this as a really great story that I thought comics could bring something to that, that hadn't been brought, mainly a visual narrative that really hasn't existed up to now. We have those great photos, those iconic photos, but that's not pure narrative. There's one bad TV movie. I think it came out in 1980. So this was really kind of wide open. And I thought, you know, I, I bet I could really do something with this. And especially since the story, we all know it. We know how it ends anyways. But I think most people, when they think about it, if they know anything about it, especially, say, from Generation X down, they know there was a protest. They know some people got shot, but they really don't know anything else about it. It's a very complicated story. All of the great forces of this era climaxed in May 1970 at Kent, Ohio, and came crashing together on that sunny hillside on a, on a grassy campus. Inexplicably, perhaps, but that was it. And, you know, it, it's really a, it's a story with a lot of moving parts, a lot of secrets, and a lot of lies. And uh, I thought it would be, be interesting to do. Now, when you start a book, you have to sit down and think, okay, what's my book about? Now, there have been a lot of books about Kent State. Um, some good, some bad. A lot written in the years immediately after the shootings. So, you know, there's been a lot of revelations in the decades since then because these secrets slowly revealed themselves. <clears throat> but very early on, I decided a really unique way to tell the story would be to tell it through the eyes of the four, the four kids who were cut down on May 4 put the reader on the ground with these kids you'd walk with them you'd see what they saw you you you'd experience what they experienced because this is a history i wanted you i wanted the reader to feel it in the way that the people who were there still feel it as the bullets whizzed over their heads as they literally saw their friends cut down in that parking lot and you know what would you do if you found her dead on the ground i wanted you i wanted the reader to be able to understand that so the entire story is built around the four sandy sandy scheuer bill schroeder allison kraus and jeff miller bill schroeder was from lorraine ohio he was uh, a ROTC cadet he was uh, attending kent state on a rotc scholarship in, in high school, he was a basketball star. He was a member of the band. He wrote his mother every week. Uh, his friends absolutely loved him. He was uh, a psychology major. He wanted to become an army psychologist and help combat veterans recover from the Vietnam War. He was just about a perfect kid. He had the, the heart of a philosopher and the mind of a scientist. <clears throat> Sandy Scheuer from Boardman, Ohio, was uh, sweet and bubbly and fun and friend to everyone she met. One of her friends said she wanted to save all the puppies in the world. She was a speech therapy major who wanted to work with uh, children with, with uh, speech impediments. <clears throat> she was the daughter of a Holocaust survivor. Jeff Miller was from Long Island, New York. There were a lot of, there was this, group of Long Islanders that were at Kent State in 1970 for some reason. I, I, I've heard that the university actually sent recruiters to New York City to try to get kids to come to Kent State, even though Kent State was growing by leaps and bounds. I'm not sure why, maybe out-of-state tuition, I don't know. Uh, Jeff was like a lot of kids then and now. He was uh, searching for his place in the world and just starting to figure out who he was and what he wanted to do at Kent State. He was creative. He was fun. He was gregarious and outgoing. And then there was Allison Krauss, originally from Cleveland Heights. <clears throat> she was the youngest of the four, just 19 years old, and she had just turned 19. She was a lot of things at once. She was this tall, statuesque beauty with this thick, impressive mane of black hair. She was whip smart and an honor student. She wanted to open an art gallery someday, um, though that was not 
you know, written in stone. She was giggly. She was silly. She was dead serious. She was uh, quick to, to anger. She was committed. She was already an experienced peace activist, though she believed in nonviolent activism. And then I added a fifth voice. I stumbled in the May 4 archive, which is a vast academic collection at the Kent State University Libraries on all things concerning the shootings. I stumbled across the account of a guardsman. And he gives his account anonymously. He takes part in literally every event over these four days that are covered in the book, from Richfield at the trucker strike, moving into Kent, and then things that happened over the weekend. And finally on May 4, he was one of the, the guardsmen on campus. He was one of the shooters. He probably fired into the air, according to the FBI. Um, it's a very detailed account, full of wonderful stories and images. Um, I think he believes he comes across a little better than he does. <laughs> he's, uh, he's a bit of a braggart. Uh, he's definitely a hard ass. Uh, he is completely unrepentant about a lot of the stuff that what happened, uh, including bayoneting unarmed students. Uh, and the big problem is he, he's not truthful at the end. He says he didn't fire. He did, according to the FBI. So he gives his account anonymously, as I said. Um, and I, I give him a fake name out of respect for him giving his, uh, his account at all, because no none of the other shooters have, have talked ever. 50 years, they're still silent. So he's the only one. So now I have five voices. And this story kind of follows these five threads throughout the four chapters, a chapter for each day. <clears throat> the story actually starts the night before April 30th, when President Nixon goes on the air, stuns the nation that US is invading neighboring Cambodia, neutral Cambodia, uh, pursuing the North Vietnamese who are stationed there, using it as a safe haven. Now, Nixon had been elected with a secret plan to end the war, as he called it. Um, he had vowed just a few months earlier that the U.S. was starting to withdraw. Now, here he was invading another country. The next day, campuses across the country exploded in anger and outrage. Remember, Vietnam was a war that was not fought purely by volunteers, as every war has been since. Half of the combat troops in Vietnam were drafted. They were forcibly conscripted. 40 or 50 million young men lived in constant fear of receiving that draft notice in the mail and being hauled off to Vietnam. It was the bane of that generation and it fueled the anti-war movement in this country. <clears throat> now at Kent, everything began very quietly. Uh, just a little rally on campus at uh, noon. A bunch of grad students buried a copy of the US Constitution in protest of Nixon's invasion of Cambodia. And an announcement was made following Monday, there would be a larger anti-war rally to be held on this spot at noon. That night, the anger finally came to Kent State. And there were about a thousand kids on Water Street, which was the bar district uh, in the center of town. Kent had like something like 23 bars around campus, which is not surprising for a, a college of 21,000 kids. And the drinking age was 18 then. So, uh, you know, there were a lot of kids lined up to get in every bar. Kids were milling about outside. They were, they kind of flowed into the street and a small group of activists, about 50, as near as I can figure, went around trying to whip up trouble. And they wanted to make a statement. They wanted to let the adult world, I guess, know that they were unhappy with what was going on. And they, they managed to pull it off. It was anger mixed with beer, mixed with who knows what else. And there was a, there was a, a big struggle and some, a lot of windows were smashed, particularly at the banks. There was a cluster of banks at Water and Main. And they went after the banks, um, the 50 activists, I mean. Um, banks fund the war, blah, blah, blah. You know, you know how, how it goes. <clears throat> the mayor of Kent at that moment, who was a uh, first term mayor named Leroy Satram, was kind of a small town rube, uh, very inexperienced, absolutely flipped out. 
And he thought that at any minute, all 21,000 students at Kent State were going to rise up as one and come streaming over the hill and burn his, his town to the ground. Um, so he made a plea to Governor Rhodes, please send the guard in to uh, restore order. Now, Rhodes, who just happened to be running for a open U.S. Senate seat, the primary was Tuesday, May 5th. He was trailing his opponent, one of the many Tafts who have run for public office in Ohio, and he was desperate. He was going to be term limited out as governor, so if he lost his primary, he would be without a government job for the first time since the 1930s. He, he was desperately looking for a way to energize his base and get the, the votes he needed to make up, the, close the gap. And here was something even better than striking Teamsters. Here were unruly student radicals, the number one boogeyman of the era. Rhodes couldn't believe his luck, and he ordered the guard to pull out of Richfield and race to Kent. <clears throat> now, the next day, as the guard is uh, restocking at the Akron Rubber Bowl, believe it or not, getting ready to move into Kent, it begins rather quietly. And I love these quiet moments in the book. There's a lot of them because this is where we, we get to know these kids. This is where you find the humanity of the story. It's not just about what happened, but it's about the people that things happen to. This is Sandy. Her mom surprises her by showing up unexpectedly, bringing her some warm weather clothes that she wanted for the last few weeks of spring quarter. Now think about what we're looking at here. First of all, this is Sandy's house. Um, but here's her mom giving, hugging her daughter. Probably, probably the last time she, she hugged her was this day. The last time she smelled her hair. The last time she heard the sound of her voice. Writing this, you know, I, I almost employed method acting because Sandy's the same age as my daughter, who's a senior at OU. And, you know, you try to put your own or I did, I tried to put my own kid in this spot and imagine what kind of emotions I would have if I got that call. And that's how you, you know, you try to conjure up the emotion you need to. It wasn't hard. I mean, it's, it, you can only imagine what these poor parents went through. It was just a nightmare. <clears throat> that night, more trouble. There was a curfew imposed so the students couldn't leave the campus, which was probably a really bad idea because they were marching around, uh, standing around inside the dorms and in the common areas, just getting madder and madder about the war and about the curfew and everything else that was going on. And that same group of radicals, which was a diminished force, uh, SDS, which was the Students for a Democratic Society, which was the biggest protest organization in the in the country, student protest organization with like 150,000 members and several thousand chapters on every campus. The Kent State SDS had been particularly active and, but they had been thrown off campus the previous spring and their leaders were actually thrown in jail. They had just gotten out, they were barred from campus by injunction. Uh, SDS was kind of a spent force at Kent State, but there were still remnants. And these guys, they wanted to, they wanted to light it up. And particularly, they wanted to light up the ROTC building, which was their big target for years. And somehow they pulled it off. And the ROTC building went up in a, it was attacked by a crowd of about 500 kids. Mostly, most of them were, probably about half of them were actually attacking the building. The rest were just kind of watching what was happening. And it took them an hour, but they got it started. And there's a lot of questions about how it started, but you know, the fact is they were they were trying to start the fire and they pulled it off. And it was at that moment that the guard streamed onto campus. And there's a lot of really dramatic drawing in this book because you know the the condition. A lot of it takes place at night. Um, I draw a really badass night scene, if I do say so myself. And you know, you've got these this pillar of fire. I mean, it's very dramatic. A lot of fun to draw, I mean, just technically drawing. And these images don't exist much anywhere else because the photo technology of the day is 
you know, the photos from May 4, which which took place in broad daylight at noon, are, are some of the greatest that we we have of the 20th century. They're absolutely iconic. But the previous three days, it all took place at night. And there's just not a lot of photos because the technology just didn't permit taking these kind of photos, especially with a pillar of fire. This is the power of comics. And this is what I can bring to the tale. I can conjure up these images based on known facts, written accounts, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, eyewitness accounts, and create something that doesn't exist until now and, and show it in narrative form very clearly. <clears throat> the next day, more tension. Uh, the day starts quietly. The guard is occupying the campus. Checkpoints are everywhere. Um, it was a pretty brutal sweep of campus the night before. A lot of kids got arrested. Um, a lot of kids got beaten, gassed. The problem is the guard came in assuming, and it was a crazy assumption, that everyone, every student on campus was a radical revolutionary. 21,000 kids. Actually, there were probably about 15,000 kids on campus that weekend. The rest had gone home or, you know, whatever they do on the weekend. But still, you're talking about maybe, you know, two, three hundred kids who were truly radicals. The rest are just kids standing in front of their dorm. Here comes the guard and gasses them. Um, it was a stunning overreach, and it was driven by the politicians. Rose didn't care. He just wanted his show of force so he could make his political point. And the guard was ordered to attack. And it, it really was, uh, it's, it's kind of a jaw-dropping uh, excessive force. <clears throat> so Sunday, tensions rise. And this book has a really interesting structure because every, the four days, every day begins quietly and then tensions rise. And then there's some big event and then a release. And the next day we get the same thing. So it's this up and down effect uh, with the story structure, but each day gets a little tenser, of course, until May 4 when we have the tragedy. It's just an interesting way to write that I've never really done that before, but that was dictated by the events itself. And then I also have these five story threads winding through the story and trying to show flipping back between each of the five to show different aspects of the story. It's not a story, it's not a book like I've written before. So that was interesting. Sunday night, about 500 kids come marching off campus and march onto Main Street and have a sit-in. They're protesting uh, the guard excesses, they're protesting the curfew on campus, they're protesting the checkpoints. Um, Remember Sunday afternoon, a lot of kids come back from being away from the weekend and the, the campus population swells from say 15 to 21,000. And these kids, I think very rightfully say, why are we being subjected to, to martial law? We didn't do anything. We hadn't been here. We were at home. We were out of town, but yet they were subjected to the same. And the guard was getting jumpier and jumpier. They were really very inexperienced soldiers, um, no experience with crowd control. They didn't know the campus. Uh, they were vastly outnumbered, even though they were the ones with the tanks and the guns. They were part-time amateur soldiers. They were, they were freaking out. And their officers, I will charitably describe as totally incompetent. <clears throat> so this is a pivotal moment because this is when the guard had a chance to lower tensions. They could have said, all right, let's talk, you know, maybe we'll, you know, we'll try to work something out tomorrow morning, go back to your dorms and we'll, you know, we'll, we'll, cooler heads will prevail. That's what they should have done. Instead, they attacked. And it was known in Kent as the night of the helicopters and it's still uh, a legendary night. There were three helicopters that flew overhead and dropped tear gas on any one that was seen outside. Students, on campus, dorms, apartments off campus, anyone. And th there were uh, about a dozen bayonetting, some serious enough to require hospitalization. It was a real, it was, uh, yeah, it was a real assault. And this is the moment when the entire thing flips. And this is the interesting part. It goes from being, now the students are really pissed off. And it goes from being about the war 
to being about the guard. Now it's students versus the guard. And the stage is set for Monday, May 4. <clears throat> well, this is how I end the, uh, the chapter. This is one of my, <laughs> the nicest pages in the book, if I do say so myself. I was actually walking along this stretch. I, I went to Ken a lot when I was working on this book to work on, you know, because as, as a visual storyteller, there's a lot to be gained from just walking these spaces and putting yourself in these spaces and just see what comes to you. So I was walking along the stretch here up by on the wall there and further down in the foreground, uh, several blocks is Bill's house. That's where he, I was actually taking some reference photos, photos down there for another scene. And I was walking down this stretch, just kind of taking in this scene when this, when this image came into my head, it's like, oh man, that'd be great. Having a helicopter fly down the river channel just you know with the light shining so that that was just a result of being in that space and I, you know that, that's how it, that's how it works so on monday may 4 noon approaches everyone is tense the guard is exhausted they've gotten an average of something like three hours sleep the last week they've been sleeping in tents they've been cold they've been they're growing increasingly frustrated because the students are defying them. They're getting more and more pissed off. The students are pissed off. The officers have no idea what they're doing. It's just getting, it's reaching ahead. And as noon approaches, my four, actually all five of my main characters come together on the commons at the same place at the same time. And the story and the, and the stage is set for, for tragedy. Um, now, if you've ever been on Kent State or any large campus at noon at the class break, you know what it's like. It's very quiet and suddenly the class break hits and tens of thousands of kids come pouring out of every building on campus and they're filling the campus greens, they're walking between class, just rivers of kids. The guard, the general in charge, particularly a guy named General Canterbury, who was later described by the presidential commission that investigated the shoot shootings as, quote unquote, a disaster, um, assumed that all of these kids were protesters. There were 200 kids around the Victory Bell, maybe 300, around the Victory Bell who were actually protesting. They were just standing there chanting. They weren't doing anything else. It wasn't violent. And in the hillside above the commons was maybe another 3,000 kids just stopping from as they're walking to class with their books to see what's going to happen, to see the drama that's going to happen. And Canterbury assumed they were all protesters, and he ordered the guard to lock and load. And lock and load means you take your gun, you put in the cartridge, you put in the clip, you put a cartridge into the chamber and it's ready to fire. All you gotta do is flip off the safety. Lock and load, going into a campus of 21,000 kids who are standing there with books in their hands. It's mind boggling, but that's why he was called a disaster. And then the guard attacked and they marched up the hill, they gassed everybody, um, everybody they found, they chased them with bayonets. They, And at this point, the students started fighting back, mainly with, uh, with rocks and stones. <clears throat> now, this is another thing that comics can do. Actually, this is harkens back to my newspaper days. I started in newspapers. Uh, one of the things I did was the, these things called news graphics, like this panel at the bottom. You used to see them in newspapers back when newspapers actually had art staves. Um, they, they show the movements very clearly in, in graphic form. I always hated doing these things when I worked for newspapers, but I was pretty good at it. Um, and I, I, I dusted those skills off again and used them here at Kent State because it's very hard to figure out exactly what the movements of the guard were during this half hour that the, this, this particular disastrous action took place. Because they were kind of careening all over the place, which was part of the the panic of the situation and the incompetence of this general. Um, in this case, they went, they were supposed to stop at Taylor Hall there. You can see in the bottom panel, 
They continued down onto a practice field, which was ringed by a high chain link fence. And then they froze and they froze down there for about 15 minutes. And this is the key moment because some of the guardsmen, particularly a unit called G Troop, which was from the Ravenna Armory, part of the 107th Armored Cav. G Troop was older. They were a group that was particularly known throughout the guard as a bunch of hard asses. And they were really pissed off. And they huddled up, a number of the guardsmen huddled up. They later denied huddling, even though we have photos of them huddling. And the consensus is, is that some kind of agreement was reached here that, okay, we've had enough. It's time to strike back. And when they marched back up the hill, G Troop suddenly swung in unison and opened fire. And they shot down the hill about 300 feet away, the length of a football field away, was a parking lot, the Prentice Hall parking lot, where the remaining protesters, there are about 50 left at this point, the rest had run off or gone out to wash the tear gas out of their eyes. <clears throat> But in the parking lot beyond were about four or 500 kids who were walking back and forth to class because that was a main artery through campus Midway Drive. And so the dorms were on one on the, uh, the right side, campus was on the classroom buildings were on the left side and there was this river of kids. And that's what G Troop fired directly into 67 bullets over a 13 second salvo not just any bullets, they, uh, they were using M1s, which was the combat rifle of World War II in Korea. It's uh, a gun, a weapon that has a range of two miles. It fires a 30 caliber copper jacketed bullet, which is over an inch long. And the M1 is so powerful, it can pump one of those bullets clean through a foot thick tree trunk or shoot four men standing in a row and kill them all. And that's what they fired into a parking lot full of kids. Four dead, nine shot and wounded, four of them critically, two of them crippled for life. <clears throat> I won't show the violence uh, here. Uh, I do not spare the violence of this event. And I was actually, you know, that was my thinking from the beginning. Because like I said at the beginning, I wanted you to feel this. I wanted you to see what happened to these kids. So I show it. And those images have never really been shown. We've seen the horrific carnage afterwards. You know, Jeffrey Miller lying face down on the pavement with that horrific river of blood. And Marianne Vecchio screaming over his body. But I actually show the moments when these kids were cut down. And I thought that was important. And it's not it. I mean, it is a book that packs a wallop at the end because we've gotten to know these kids, which is exactly what I wanted you to do. And now we see them cut down. And I was actually talking about this with the, uh, with the Shoyers. Um, Sandy's uh, niece and her sister, Audrey, her surviving family. And they absolutely encouraged me to do this. They said, oh yeah, you have to show it. You must show it. You must show what happened to Sandy. So they get it, but it's, it's tough to see. Let's talk a little bit about the research. I spent two years researching this book just purely at the beginning. It took four years total. So I spent two years just doing interviews and research. I started with interviews. You know, growing up here in Northeast Ohio, um, I was always amazed at how many people I knew in my life over the years who were there. Now, Kent is a huge arts hub. So there's a lot of people in the arts community in Cleveland and Akron who went to Kent. Um, I knew a lot of people in media who were there on campus, either covering the protests and the shootings or uh, student journalists at the Daily Kent Stater. And then I, I even know a couple guys in the comics community who were there. I couldn't believe it. Uh, there's one guy I've known for years, and, and uh, we were just talking one day. He said, oh, yeah, I was there. I've never really talked about it, but I was there. I was there on May 4. 
And slowly, he actually gave me his story. And it was a great story. It's the first time he's ever talked about it. And a lot of these interviews uh, ended in tears. I mean, it is really amazing to me how raw this is to the students of 1970. I mean, they have never recovered from this, from seeing their friends cut down, from feeling those bullets whiz over their heads. So after I had the interviews, and that was really the heart and soul of, of what I was trying to do, then I started to dig into the facts and the, you know, the documentation. And a great source was the May 4 collection in the Kent State Main Library, top floor of this building here, which is really a world-class archive. I mean, it's, it's got everything. Uh, accounts, many, many accounts, like over 150 oral histories that were recorded. It's got written histories. It's got correspondence. It's got government papers. It's got testimonies. It's got, you name it, um, uh, the papers of the mayor, the papers of the university president at the time, the papers of SDS. It's really, it took, a, it, it was a mountain of material. And there's another collection at Yale University called the Kent State Collection. Um, it has just as much material. So it, it was really a unique problem that there was almost too much material. The, the challenge was digging through all this stuff and finding what was useful and, you know, the stuff that was not useful. Um, unique problem. <clears throat> Daily Kent Stater was a great source. Um, the archive it was published uh, four days a week throughout, during this period. And it was a good paper. It was a good student paper. And no one covers a university and a campus community better than a good student paper. And especially the activities of SDS and the university response. It was really terrific. Now it stops at May. I mean, it doesn't go beyond May 4 because the university was closed. University was closed, the paper's closed. So that was a big loss. But it was still a lot of, lot of useful information. Probably my number one source or news reporting was the Kent Stater. <clears throat> I spent a lot of time researching the radical politics of the era, which is really fascinating stuff. I kind of went down the rabbit hole here, uh, particularly the radical fringe of SDS, which was a group called the Weathermen. The Weathermen were the forgotten terrorists of, in American history. But in 1970, they were the FBI's most wanted individuals. They had all gone underground and vanished but they were, they absolutely scared the bejesus out of the Nixon administration and most law enforcement who inflated their number vastly to like 10,000 people. In fact, there was less than a hundred of them, but they were effective. I mean, they, well, effective is in, you know, making big shows. I mean, they were not effective. They were not a effective radical group. They were not an effective student group. They were not an effective uh, revolutionary group. They had no support. But they did, they, they bombed the US Capitol building. They bombed the Pentagon. They bombed over 30 government, corporate and police buildings over like a three year period. And, they, and the FBI couldn't find them. They had an entire squad looking for them. They couldn't find them. They spent millions and they never did find them. So you can really go, you know, like I said, you can really go down the rabbit hole here. And it's really history that's not well known because it wasn't really been collected or documented. Um, the major weathermen only have given their accounts over the last 10 years or so. So, I mean, it's, and it, they had a big presence in Cleveland, huge presence in Cleveland. Now, remember our, uh, the thinker in front of the, the art museum was blown up just weeks before the activities at Kent State. Bombs were the, were the, 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 uh, calling card of the weathermen. So either it was someone inspired by the weathermen or, or an actual weatherman who blew that thing up. The only master work of art in U.S. history that's been attacked by, by terrorists. And it's ours. I love our uh, blown up thinker. I think it's uh, a wonderful piece of art. Anyways. <clears throat> now I spent as much time on visual research as I spent on factual research because it's a visual medium. And remember with Kent State, um, nothing changes more and more quickly than a campus and a, and a college town. It's just constant churn, you know, things come and go, buildings go up, buildings come down. And I'm shooting for a very small window here, just four days in May, 1970. 
So something like a campus map from 1970 was just was just gold because it shows where all the buildings were. This is a little tricky because Kent State was building so rapidly that some of these buildings were only halfway complete, like that main library I showed you. That was under construction. So I had to get the exact construction right. I mean, um, my problem is, is that as an outsider, I didn't go to Kent. Um, I didn't, I, like I said, I was only 10 years old. I didn't, I went to college, you know, a decade later. Um, <clears throat> so it was that kind of disconnect. I didn't have that intimate knowledge of a college campus or the town that people who actually went there did. I mean, I could sit down right now and draw Ohio State in 1982 and probably get 80% of it right just from memory. But Kent, I was going in cold and it really was, uh, it really was tricky. It was a visual minefield, especially Kent State, which grew so fast, um, really uh, faster than any university in the country. In 1960, Kent State had 6,000 kids and like 30 buildings. In 1970, it was 21,000 kids and over a hundred buildings. That is incredible growth. <clears throat> so um, I'm sure I like, screwed up a roof line here and there and I'll probably get called on it by some student of 1970, but I gave it my best shot. For example, really tricky was recreating this bar, this uh, bar scene on Water Street. It's just this little stretch of bars and clubs. Every college has them, but there was very little visual reference, almost none because you know, it was a grungy bar street and, and, and who cares? Why would you take a photo of that? Remember back in, in 1970, we had a different relationship with photography. It's not like now where you hold up a cell phone camera and shoot off a hundred shots. Back then you had to have a camera, you had to have film, you had to have, you know, a big flash rig. If you're shooting at night, you have to process the film, print the film. You know, it, it really was expensive. It took skill. It took a lot of equipment. So we had a different relationship with it and there are just no photos. <clears throat> I spent a lot of time on Water Street trying to get it right. Now I had street guides that I could use. Um, a lot of the buildings are gone. Uh, they've been burned or knocked down or just, you know, I don't know what happened to them. So I started to reconstruct them. You know, I worked on this thing for like uh, two months trying to figure out exactly where things were on Water Street. And I went down to Water Street and, you know, the surviving buildings, I had the addresses. So I'd write those in and then try to figure out what was directly across the street and, you know, slowly build the thing up and then try to track down photo reference. And the photo reference just wasn't there, not a lot of it. But I'm really proud of the, the way I solve this problem, even though it's just pure dumb luck. I just stumbled across this. This is a documentary filmed in 1971, a year after the shootings. And the narrator, a guy named E.G. Marshall, who I think was the voice of Timex watches back then, um, you know, commercials, <clears throat> was narrating what happened on uh, Friday night, and there's Water Street, and there it is. There are the facades, there are the signs, that's all I needed. I mean, it's just a crappy, you know, uh, quality photo, but it was enough that I could, that I could paint this scene. And that, that was, <laughs> you know, it's just kind of dumb luck. <clears throat> and once in a while, you stumble across just little nuggets of gold in the course of your research. This is a phone message that was left for Sandy. There was a number of them in uh, the May 4 Center at Kent State. <clears throat> now, phone messages were the texts of 1970. Kids didn't have texting then, of course, but they were still communicating with each other constantly. And they did it by the phone. And they would call up. They would call some place where the students were going to be, the dorm or, you know, uh, in this case, the speech lab where Sandy worked. And they left a message with the student volunteer that was manning the phones. And then that student would write these things down on these message forms and tag it to a message board. That's what that literally means. It was a board with messages tagged to it. And when the kids came in or went out, they would look on the board. And if they saw a message addressed to them, that's how they got the message. And this is just this is from a guy named Steve Drucker, who was Sandy's boyfriend freshman year. They had broken up, but they'd remained friends. And um, he was also Jeff Miller's roommate. They shared a house together in 1970. So he's a really great interview. 
uh, he just gave me just unbelievable stories and some great, some of the best scenes of the book come from Drucker. But this is just a little sweet message. I took a picture of it to send to him because I didn't know if he had it and indeed he didn't. Hi, how about supper at five? I'll call you. But then I noticed the name, Miss Beach. Sandy Beach? What the hell's, <laughs> so I asked Drucker, what's up with this name? And he said, oh yeah, that was my nickname for her. I called her that because that's what she was. She was a sun-splashed Sandy Beach. And her friends picked up on that and they started calling her that and it became her nickname. I was like, oh man, that's great. And nobody else has that. Nobody else has that. And I worked that into the dialogue in the book. So it's in there. And that's just because I stumbled across this phone message and, and noticed something odd. So those are the little victories that you live for as a researcher. Um, like I said, I spent the first two years researching the book and then it took two years to draw the book and I'll wrap it up with showing you how that came together. Um, whoops, sorry. This is how I write. <clears throat> um, these are called thumbnails and they're just, you know, little uh, eight and a half by 11 sheet of paper cut in half. And I write always visually in the dialogue at the same time. I mean, I kind of see these things not as written scenes. I mean, I see them visually right from the beginning, like little film clips almost that, you know, play out in my head. And <clears throat> I write scene by scene and they, they tend to come together pretty quickly. The tougher thing is the transitions between the scenes but, and not every scene comes together really neatly, but most of them come together pretty fast. Now, keep in mind, I've done a lot of research. I've done my, I know my story structure. I've, I've blocked out the story already. I have notes. I know where it's going. I know what's going to happen on each day. And so then I start writing like this. And after that, I go to a pencil and it's a detailed pencil. <clears throat> and this is the most time intensive part of the process. This is where I take all the visual research I've collected and pour it into the book. For example, at the bottom there, the last panel, that's Sandy's actual street, Summit Street. So those are the houses. I put in period cars, I put in period clothes. Um, <clears throat> this is a period piece. So there was a lot of research that went into fashion and automobiles and all of this stuff. Um, old Montgomery Ward catalogs were particularly useful to come up with patterns and, and fashions. Um, and so this takes the, this is the longest part of the process. This, this generally takes a long time, but you can see from the thumbnail to the pencil, that's pretty accurate. There aren't a lot of changes there. I changed the angle on a couple panels, but for the most part, it's right there. And that's just, that's just instinct. You know, that comes from a lifetime of, of making comics and reading comics. I just, I don't think about it a lot. Um, it, it seems to come very naturally at this point, graphic narrative. So I go with my instinct. I mean, that's not to say that every scene or every page is that easy. This one came together pretty easy, but sometimes you really have to labor over a page. Sometimes you have to do it two or three times, not often, thank God. Sometimes you have to make patches. Sometimes it just doesn't, you know, I mean, there are pages you struggle over. And after the pencils, um, I pencil the entire book. <clears throat> In this case, it was 250 pages. So 250 pencil. And when I'm happy with that, I ink it. Um, I work by hand. This is pen and pen and brush on paper. Not because I'm a Luddite, I'm not, but uh, just because I enjoy the physical act of drawing. And I like the feeling of a pen scraping across the paper. It's just something I enjoy. It's something I've done in my whole life. And it's very Zen to me. So that's the way I work. After this step, uh, and I add the type in the word balloons and um, I scan it into the computer and then 
with an Apple Pencil and an iPad Pro, I add the finishes. So it's a four-step process. Thumbnail, pencil, inks, finishes. <clears throat> now, if I was going to do full color, this is where I'd add the color. I, you know, I it would have been great to do full color here, but that would have added another year to the process, or I would have had to have hired a colorless, probably more like it, but it still would have added a lot of time. And the deadline was pretty hard on this. I mean, I started it four years ago, but you know, it was just so much work. Um, I didn't have time to go color. I don't think color would add a lot to the story. I mean, if I had my druthers, it would have been color, but there just wasn't time. <clears throat> now this is a two page spread. Uh, remember, this is how you look at a book. You know, when you open a book, you're looking at two pages at once. It's not it's not page by page. So you get uh, uh, a graphic novelist has to think of those two pages together because that's the first visual impression the reader is going to have. Um, so this is a thumbnail. Here's the pencil. Now I know this is a night scene was gonna have some pretty dramatic lighting. I don't have to fill everything in. I, I know, you know what I'm gonna do here as I'm, as I'm penciling it, I know. So it's gonna be very dramatic. And indeed, when you add the ink, that's when it really becomes dramatic. This is, I think, one of my nicer spreads in the book. So again, thumbnail, pencil, inks and finishes <clears throat> and that's how a graphic novel comes together you know <laughs> so it's 250 thumbnails 250 pencils 250 inks 250 finishes you just keep going through wave by wave i could probably do maybe uh three pencils a day and that's a long day um maybe four or five inks a day yeah and uh like I said, the deadline was tight. I promised myself after my last book that I wasn't gonna have a tight deadline and damned if I didn't do it to myself again. I keep promising myself I'm not gonna you know, go through that. Um, it was two years of really intense work. The last two years were tough. I mean, I was just flying seven days a week, probably 10 or 12 hours a day, but I had to hit that deadline, you know? And like I said, it was supposed to come out in conjunction with the 50th commemoration of the anniversary, which would have been really nice. I, it would have been an honor to be a part of that. Um, there were a couple books about Kent State that came out this year, but not, not many. Um, and I was really looking forward to it. Um, it was gonna be a huge event on campus, you know, four days. It's interesting that the days fall in exactly the same sequence. So May 1st was Friday. May 4 was Monday this year. And they were expecting something like 15,000 people on campus. They were actually closing the university that weekend. And they were expecting all these old, old students to return. And it was, they were, the students were really looking forward to it because they have been really not included for a long time. The university spent decades trying to bury the shootings because the shootings really, really harmed the university. I mean, as far as growth, as far as money, and uh, uh, it was a real blow to the university. Um, and they just tried to bury it and that didn't really work. And it's only been over the last maybe five to 10 years where the university has really embraced its history as a, as a teaching tool. And now if you go to the university, it's a national historical site now. Um, they have a wonderful May 4 Center. They have a walking tour. They've really, uh, really made it part of the university. And I think that's, that's a wonderful thing. And this was going to be the students of 1970. This was going to be their moment in the sun. You know, they were finally getting the acknowledgement that, yes, um, this is something that uh, was horrible and, and you were part of it and, and we're very sorry. And it was all wiped out by the virus. I mean, it just went up in a puff of smoke. And I feel really bad for them because, uh, you know, not to be morbid, but I mean, these guys are all in their 70s, you know.
and how many more chances are they going to have? You know, I don't know if it, how many will be left for the the seventieth or the sixtieth uh, commemoration. So it was very sad, but um, that's just where we stand. And the reason, as I said, I, I took on this project is because I felt it was a story worth telling. It's just such a great story and full of emotion and power. And I, I knew it was relevant, but now it is really relevant. And I feel that we've circled back around to 1970. We have that same partisan rage. We have that same us versus them mentality. Um, an authoritarian president, uh, politics, the whole bit is just, uh, it, it's setting up to be the same way. And, and I fear that we are very, very close to another Kent State. Uh, this is meant, this book is meant to be a warning, really. Uh, just a reminder that when you threaten those in power, truly threaten them, uh, their response can be lethal. That's not to say that people in power shouldn't be threatened, that people shouldn't take to the streets. Um, I think they should, but they need to have that knowledge that uh, it's dangerous. And that's something that really the students of 1970 lacked. They didn't even think the guard had loaded guns until the moment they opened fire. Even as they were opening fire, people were yelling, they're just blanks. And then the bullets hit flesh and bone. So it's a caveat that's worth, worth making. Uh, that's my talk, Travis. Durf, here I am. All right. <clears throat> yeah, that was that was great. You you really uh, you really answered a lot of the questions that, that <laughs> so we was had going along. during during the talk, kind of. Thing. Sorry about that. That's okay. Yeah, it's a very informative talk, and the uh, it was really cool to see how the uh, you know how it came together mm -hmm. there from the you know the four stages. Um, I don't know if you know this, but a lot, like every librarian in Ohio, pretty much went to Kent State because it's the only because yeah, it's, it's the only the masters. Yeah, right, right. The school library so, school. Yeah, librarians and teachers went to Kent State. So. <laughs> that is that is correct. Yeah, um, but yeah, the the uh, the the walk through the uh, like the May four walking tour is a pretty cool, uh, pretty cool and and real thing for it's sure. very moving you know if you haven't had a chance to go to campus and and stand in that space i i really encourage people to do it because it's uh it's a very emotional thing to to stand there and look down the hill and see where those kids fell and walk up and put your finger through the bullet hole in the down drum sculpture i mean it it becomes very very real and you just wonder how did they why did this happen you know how did they allow this to happen yeah. Um, one, one thing you were talking about just just now, you were talking about the parallels between 19, you know, 1970 and today. Um, and you're anyway, the, this afternoon, I was out walking my dog through my neighborhood. And I was talking to this old this old guy in my neighborhood and he was expressing, you know, kind of being afraid right now and i think i think what people are afraid for right now is what you you know which, which is what you were talking about something like this happening you know some right. some event happening and and your book is about the moment it happened and yet you know it's at the beginning of the nixon presidency it's uh vietnam still goes on for five years but it the, starts to the, draw down the year yeah. after yeah yeah so so the, the world goes on is my mm -hmm. point though so i'm wondering if in researching this time you found anything any reason to be hopeful for the current <laughs> moment instead of afraid you know what i well, mean well i don't know if it's really that that's really applicable because you know we don't know what's going to happen in this country over the next year and well, we have no but, idea. But clearly, clearly, you think we, you think that old man and and myself and others are, are right to be afraid. Yeah, something. well, everybody's afraid. Who's not afraid? You know, I mean, yeah. you know, the entire West Coast is on fire. I mean, <laughs> streets everywhere are <laughs> roiled with unrest. Uh, we're all got this hideous pandemic. I mean, it's just one thing after another, and right? it's, um, 
there's never quite been a year like it. I mean, 2020 will soon have it soon have its own unique mark. Um, and I think it's going to be a pretty permanent one. Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, I guess it's super unlucky to publish a book during a pandemic, but at the same yeah, time, that's it, not, that's not the greatest time to put one out. Yeah. To be <laughs> sure. But it couldn't, couldn't be more relevant. Though. Right. Right. So. Well, that's just, you know, that's just the hand I was dealt. Um, <laughs> We'll have to see what happens as far as how the book sells, how the book is received. I mean, whether anybody cares. I mean, it seems to be getting really good response. Um, it's got great reviews, uh, but you know, it's all kind of up in the air. It's all brave new world. Uh, you know, what can you do? You know, you throw yeah. it out there and see how it lands. Yeah, that's and, all. That's what you got to do. Right. That doesn't lessen the value of the work any, you know, I mean, it's just, that's just the reality of, of the situation outside the door. And I think that this book, you know, I'm happy to say that every book I've done, I thought was the best book I could possibly do at the time that I made it. And that doesn't mean that, you know, I haven't gotten better. I think I have gotten better in some res respects with each subsequent book. But, you know, as long as I can feel that when I finish a book, then I have to be happy because, you know, I gave up my best shot. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you, I, I read that uh, you worked for 20 years on my friend Dahmer. And yeah. Then off and on. Gave, yeah. And this off one and he on. gave four years to. So. Right. right. But, well, yeah, but this was a hard four years. My friend Dahmer was just, you know, it was just ridiculously long, but I, you know, I'd pick away at it. This one was like a sprint. My friend Dahmer was more like a long walk. Yeah, it's it's crazy that four year sprint. That's a long sprint. That That's a long like a sprint. It is. People. It is. <laughs> it is a long sprint. Um. So I was I was wondering if well, one thing maybe you didn't touch on in the talk there. Um, if there's if you see a through line between your work from you know like this book, my friend Dahmer. They're both set in the '70s. They're both uh, they're both about these tragic moments that are also like these huge, larger than life cultural events. Mm -hmm. um, Those two are. Yeah, and I'm I'm wondering if there's a th thematic through line in the rest of your work that you. No, see. not particularly. Well, they're all set in in uh, Northeast Ohio. I mean, that's that's the big common thing theme there. I mean, trashed was. His fiction is set in the modern day. When did it come out? 2016 or 2015? I can't even remember now. And so that was set then. Uh, my first book was set in 1980 during the punk rock era. And then Dahmer was set in the 70s. And this was set at the end of the 60s. So, I mean, it does bop around. I do period pieces and then I've done a current work. And my comic strip, which I did for 20 years, was all current. I mean, that was like what's happening right now. So, you know, I, I don't limit myself to period pieces or a particular, you know, a particular period. Um, I like variety. I, mostly I'm just looking for great stories. You know, if the story, if it's a great story, that's really what attracts me. And uh, Kent State has been on a short list of books of my, that I wanted to get to for years, as long as my friend Dahmer. But honestly, I didn't think I had the drawing skills to tell it until I got a couple books under my belt. Because I came very late to graphic novels. You know, my first graphic novel didn't come out until 2010. So I've only been doing it for 10 years. And it's a very different skill set than doing, say, a, a comic strip or doing a political cartoon. And I just needed to figure out this art form a little better. And, uh, uh, you know, you can make the argument that I still haven't figured it out, but well, that's very much up in the air. But I, I'm fairly happy with the artwork in this book. So I, I think it's at least effective, it's at least good enough. I think at times it's uh, a little better than that. So, um, you know, it was really the story that drove it. Yeah, I mean, clearly you've thought a lot about uh, what makes a, what, what a graphic novel brings to the table that's, uh, you know, different that, a, that mm -hmm. a kind of a narrative nonfiction book can't bring um right well the visuals and can say it has never really been told visually like this yeah. so i understand there's a film in the works but it's a couple years away hmm. so sorry guys i beat you to it 
Um, <laughs> they couldn't make the 50th anniversary. But, no, they but could you. not make the 50th anniversary. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I mean, visuals just bring a, a whole different level to the book, especially, I think I mentioned this, I can't remember now, especially when the movements are, and, and things that are happening are so confusing on a ground level, suddenly, you know, I can take it above, show a bird's eye view or, you know, very clearly show these movements. And that's what I can bring to the telling of the story and fill in some gaps. Cool. Yeah, so just just a couple more, uh, couple more questions. Sure. Uh, <laughs> I, I guess I'll just ask, I'll ask three more, okay? That's uh, fine. We got no place to go. <laughs> We're all locked down. <laughs> what else are we going to do? <laughs> I'm not doing anything. All right. So, so uh, can you can you describe your signature style? Can and I how just... did you come up with it? And what are your well, reasons? well, that depends because my signature style has changed about five or six times over <laughs> the course of my career. Um, you know, I, I'm self-taught, so um, I think I only went to art school briefly and ran screaming into the street after about six months. And then at Ohio State, I didn't set foot in an art class. You know, I, I was doing cartoons for the school paper and really kind of learned on the job, which shows an incredible degree of chutzpah because, um, you know, the Ohio State Lantern, Ohio State's huge, of course, the Ohio State Lantern printed 35,000 copies a day. And here I was throwing my crappy little cartoons onto this thing and everybody on campus was reading them. And I don't remember feeling the slightest hesitation at that. It's like, wow, where did that fearlessness come from? Because it certainly was uncharacteristic of me at the time. But, um, you know, I just kind of figured it out as I went along and, and I went down a lot of stylistic dead ends. Um, in the late eighties, I started coming up with that real crazy post-punk expressionism that uh, I first became known for that's that was just a matter of trial and error and s taking in outside stimuli and, and seeing what was happening in the arts and in print and all kinds of stuff zines and processing it on my own and once I found that voice um, I was off and running and then it's just been refining it over the years when I started doing long form storytelling I, I found that that style was not uh useful because it was just too experimental it was just too expressionist and crazy and you want clarity i mean at least i do with the stories i wanted to tell i wanted clarity so i began uh developing a new style trying to still take maybe elements of my old style like the heavy inking and the, um you know the kind of organic look of it and and develop polishing it and developing it and i think with each book i get a little a little better uh, i think that can say it is definitely the best drawn book i've done though i'm happy with all four of my books but you know uh um i try to do work on something a little different and with kent state you know the challenges were so many i've never quite drawn a book like this like i said there were a lot of night scenes there were a lot of crowd scenes there were a lot of military scenes. There were a lot of military crowd night scenes. I mean, this is stuff I've never even attempted before. And, um, you know, you have to rise to meet the challenge. I mean, you just, you, when you do a book, you really just, you have to be fearless. It's like, all right, I'm just going to throw myself into it and, and, and just, you know, do the best I can. I mean, there were some pages that I worked on for days. Like that one shot, there's that one shot on the sit-in which is that, you know, that big aerial view of all those kids on the street. I, it took yeah. me four days to draw that page. Hmm. So, you know, you just have to, you just have to plug it away at it. Um, it's not, you know, it's, it's just a matter, I would say developing a style is just and constantly working the craft. And uh, I mean, it's like any other art form. You just, you just try to get a little better with each one. How, uh, how come you didn't go to art school? You, you showed that picture of when, uh, you know, you drew when you were 10. Yeah. It's way better than I can draw, than I can draw now. <laughs> you must have been passionate about it, you know, way back yeah. then. How oh, yeah. I mean, school? I was, my mother doesn't remember a time when I wasn't drawing, like four years old. I was, you know, I think 
you know, cartoonists are born, they're not made. It's just some sad, <laughs> sad compulsion that we have that we have to constantly be scribbling. Um, and uh, yeah, you know, I just, I went to art school briefly and I didn't like it. I just, uh. I wanted more, I wanted more stimulation. You know, it, art school was just, it was all it was. It was just drawing. And I've always been interested in writing and drawing hmm. and putting words and, you know, in, in my character's mouths. And I wasn't getting that at art school. And so when I went to Ohio State, I actually majored in journalism. Hmm. I didn't, because I wanted, you know, I thought, well, that'll be the best thing to learn how to write. And it was, it was great. And uh, I actually went on a scholarship. They gave me a journalism scholarship because I've always been a good writer as well as a, as a good artist. You have to have both to, to do graphic novels. You can't, it can't just be one or the other. It's both intertwined. Um, and that's, you know, it, I never hesitated. That that was just the way it came together. Yeah, you're probably one of the last generation of journalism majors to that actually get a job in journalism. <laughs> well, whatever journalism <laughs> is moving forward, certainly not print, but uh, there'll always yeah, be. Yeah, there's, yeah, there's some. There'll always be journalism of some kind. Maybe the um, Russians will hire the new grads to, uh, you know. <laughs> You, you read these stories about people unwittingly working for the Russians. Yeah, I just read that story. Yeah, yeah. That's really sad. Yeah. Um, here's, here's an interesting question. Are there any plans to collect the Baron of Prospect strips? Ah, uh, the Baron of Prospect Avenue. That was a follow-up to uh, um, my first book, Punk Rock and Trailer Parks, uh, just for fun. I was, what was, what did I just finish? I guess I finished Trashed. No, I can't remember now if it was Trashed or My Friend Dahmer. It might have been My Friend Dahmer. I just wanted, I was touring the world a lot because uh, My Friend Dahmer has been translated into 15 languages, I think. Hmm. And so I'm going to get all these free trips, which is like this great payoff of being a graphic novelist. Um, for example, I've been to France uh, 23 times since uh, my friend Dahmer was released uh, eight years ago. So, um, yeah, it's great. Uh, so I just wanted a side project just for fun. Not, I didn't have to work on it. I didn't have to think about it. didn't have to struggle with it. And I applied for one of those county art grants, Cuyahoga County Art Grants, which was like, I think, 15 grand or something like that. I can't remember. It was a nice chunk of change. And damned if I didn't get it. And I thought, oh, crap. Now I've got to do, I've got to produce something. So the Baron of Prospect <laughs> Avenue is what I drew. And it was just kind of this freeform story that I was just drawing to see where it went. Uh, There's some problems with it. Um, the original story I was going to do, I don't think I can do anymore. It was set in uh, Kay's Books, which was this legendary bookstore in downtown Cleveland with over a million books and this crazy cast of characters that work there. Um, it was on Prospect Avenue, as I said. Uh, the building's still there. It's the only building left on that stretch, in fact. And um, it involved a lot of stuff about Cleveland at that time, which was, you know, the era of default and, and the really funky era of Cleveland. I was and I had this great character from the earlier book. But uh, the main villain of the story was a guy that actually worked for Kay's named uh, Frank Spizak. Do you know who Frank Spizak is? He was a uh, mass shooter in Cleveland. He killed five or six people in 80, 81, I think, 81, 82. He was a, uh, uh, at times, he was a uh, transsexual prostitute. At times, he was uh, a Nazi, and <laughs> the guy just had a head full of cats. And they finally caught him, and they, they only, I think they finally put him in the gas chamber like maybe five, six years ago. He's, he terrorized the entire city for a couple, a couple years, and he worked at Kay's Books. So it was kind of a natural fit. You know, I was interviewing people who worked there, and it's like, wow, that would be, be a great villain. But I don't know that I can really do that now. You know, the political climax at this moment, I mean, certainly you don't want to, you know, get lumped in with J.K. Rowling and what's happening to her right now. 
And, you know, I don't know, you know, you got the, you've got our own resurgent Nazis, you've got the BLM protests. I mean, it's just, it doesn't seem like the, the proper book to be, to be producing. So I've, I've kind of shelved it, unfortunately. Yes. Maybe I'll revisit it, but I don't know. <laughs> Sounds a little fraught. You, you might, yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Might, uh, might have to find the right way to approach it. Yeah, I don't, I don't I, you know, some things just don't work out. <laughs> that's, yeah. <laughs> that's the breaks. Uh, so, any any advice for an aspiring comic book artist or, or an aspiring graphic novelist? Ah, uh, well, yeah. I mean, the business changes constantly. So you have to keep one's head a step ahead of the changes. I would say, you know, depending on your genre that you're targeting, and you should target a genre. Uh, right now, the the big growth in comics is kids' books, as you as a librarian know. Dave Pilkey, especially, or uh, um, tween books. Um, Dave Pilkey's from Cleveland, in fact. Tween books. Terry Liebenson has a series out now that's uh, he's hugely popular for tweens she's a, she's from uh, beachwood um that's where the super growth is in those series if you can come up with a great kid series man it is just ka -ching. uh original graphic novels like mine are enjoying a lot of, of really healthy growth in terms of readership the comics that are dying are superhero comics they're just kind of mm. going and uh for a variety of reasons they're too expensive uh um, the companies are owned by giant corporations that have a different agenda and they're just not very good. In a lot of them, they've just kind of played out. So you have to pick your, you know, you have to pick where you're going and have a plan, but mostly I think, you know, you just, you just make comics. I mean, uh, you learn by making and it's not hard to make comics. Those you need a piece of paper and a pen. It, comics are easy to make. Now, good comics, those are hard to make. And that only comes from just doing it and just keep doing it. And I'm a firm believer that good work finds a way. If you do good, compelling work, it will somehow find its way to publishers. It will somehow find its way to readers. That doesn't say it'll be easy, but I think ultimately it will, it will find its way. And I'm a living example of that. I mean, I didn't have my breakthrough work till I was 50 years old. So I'm an overnight sensation after... 30 years working. <laughs> There's a lot of those out there, I think. Are there? I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> it seemed like a good thing to say. Yeah. Um, so you mentioned a few other Northeast Ohio, you know, comics writers. Uh, who, who are the other, who are some other, you know, local comics writers that you... Local comics writers? Well, yeah. uh, you know, Brian Michael Bendis, who was the main writer at DC, he's, he's from Cleveland. Huh. He's also from the east side. I think he's from Cleveland Heights. Huh. Um, uh, who else? Uh, Brian Azzarillo, who's a very famous superhero writer. He's also from east side of Cleveland. Uh, a lot of guys from Columbus. Columbus has a very vibrant comic scene. Um, there's kind of a Columbus, Cleveland, Pittsburgh triangle, which has always been this real... Uh, um, kind of spawning ground of comics i don't know what it is i guess long winters maybe we're all just sitting around in our houses drawing drawing comics um but it's always you know all the way back to the beginning of comics and you know the beginning of the 20th century this has been where a lot of comics have come out of so yeah there's so there's a lot going on and there's some great festivals for people to go to, uh, you know, the Billy Ireland Cartoon Museum at Ohio State is a world-class facility. It's amazing. They have an annual festival called Columbus Crossroads Columbus, Cartoon Crossroads Columbus, which is, I think, taking place next week or the week after, virtually, unfortunately, mm -hmm. as everything else is. Um, yeah, no, comics are a real, real uh, artistic and civic treasure in Ohio. Cool. All right, last question. Mm. what uh what are you working on now what can we look forward to next got me uh, yeah. <laughs> uh it's been a tough year to try to be creative you know um <laughs> so you haven't been you haven't been nose to the grindstone <laughs> during the pandemic more well you know i had i mean i was gearing up for this you know entire 40 tour book tour 
Yeah. So I yeah. was putting together presentations. I was, you know, getting ready and, and that went up like that, you know, in a space of like two days, it yeah. was done. And I was like, I think three, three legs to Europe over the summer wow. into the fall. Yeah. All gone. And, uh, you know, I was just kind of left there with the egg on my face. It's like, I, I realize this is petty. I know this is petty with all that's happening in the world. Who <laughs> no, cares? No, but, but you know, I'm a comics no. creator and we're petty. So just, <laughs> you know, chalk it up to that. And, you know, I was kind of in mourning about that for a while. It's like, well, oh, what I, do I do? What do I do now? How could you not be? Yeah. So I just kind of, uh, you know, I watched movies and read books and, uh, and did some other stuff for a couple months, and then finally I started yeah. gearing up for promotion again. Now virtually, yeah, you know, practicing my dog and pony show here. Um, I've you know I've got some ideas I'm kicking around. Nothing has really leapt out. I tend to uh, I tend to really promote a book hard for you know about six months, and then then move on to another project because you have to sell your book. Yeah. because we do books for people to read them and if you don't promote them no one will read them and what's the point of doing it <laughs> yeah. so you gotta you gotta put in the miles and uh that's what i've been doing now and uh, you know i've got events almost every day for the next month so not a lot of yeah. time to work yeah i think uh i think a lot of these books that some books that came out in march and then some books that were you know set to come out in may or june and, and were delayed there's a there's a lot of a lot of that publicity is starting to happen now. Starting well, I guess there's a huge stuff. backlog of books, and they're all coming out at once. I mean, that's the the big fear. They're coming out either there now is. or in January. Yeah, it's because, it's an interesting time in libraries and to be I'll purchasing bet. purchasing books in libraries because you don't want to you want to fit everything into your uh, you know 2020 budget. You don't want right. to have a backlog of books on the shelf so you know, like everything else it's you know a, a <laughs> hardship an economic hardship yeah. and, 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 and and a practical hardship i mean it's you know we're just deal with it a day at a time and hopefully one day we'll be back to semi-normal <laughs> and i'm really looking forward to that <laughs> <laughs> aren't we all <laughs> yeah. well thank you durf and uh, everyone everyone follow the link buy the book there's signed books available at max backs yep you can order them i'll sign them i'll personalize them the links there and you're supporting you, a good indie bookstore you you uh you i i bought a signed book from you when you did that reading and mentor a couple years ago mm. and, you, and you drew like uh yeah i do a little title page i was, do little title page drawings it's and one, max it's will probably my Probably my favorite uh, signed book I have. Oh, well, there you go. So. See, free art, free art, yeah. everyone. Yeah, and Max art. does mail free. order. Max will ship them to you. So, um, it's. I think I've done maybe. Gosh, I think I'm on like 900 books for them. I've signed over the last few weeks. Oh, really? Wow. Yeah, it's Fantastic. been kind of crazy. Yeah, that's cool. <laughs> it's cool. Well, it's all good I got. for you and good for There's, Max. There so. are no more live signings. So, yeah, that's it. All right. Well, I guess. Uh, I'm going to sign off of Facebook here.